Misery. Anyone who's read the book or seen the movie knows the story, which revolves around author and Stephen King surrogate Paul Sheldon. Paul's the author of a very successful series of cheesy romance novels featuring the protagonist, Misery Chastain. The books have made Paul rich and famous, but he's at a point where he despises writing them and yearns to move on to more serious literature. While driving through a snowstorm in Colorado, Paul crashes his car, totaling the vehicle and nearly himself, but he's rescued from certain death by nurse Annie Wilkes, who, as luck, bad luck that is, would have it, knows who exactly Paul is. Turns out she's his number one fan. While tending to Paul, who was for all intents and purposes and unable to communicate with the outside world, Annie finds to her great dismay that Paul has killed off her beloved misery and what he plans on being the last of those books. But this will not do, no, 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 and Paul goes from being Annie's patient to being her prisoner right quick. Because if I die, you die. In order to force him to write the book that she wants, she goes through extreme measures to ensure he can't get away. One measure being chopping off his foot. Great late night reading material from the master of horror, sure, but would this claustrophobic two-hander make a good film? Turns out, yes, an Oscar winning film to boot. And so we're going to find out just what the f happened to Misery. We'll try to keep the curse words to a minimum. We know Annie doesn't like profanity. And in the bank do I tell Mrs. Bollinger, oh, here's one big bastard of a check. Give me some of your Christing money. See what you made me do. King says that the initial inspiration for the book was the short story by Evelyn Woe called The Man Who Liked Dickens, about a man in South America held prisoner and forced to read Charles Dickens stories. King wondered what it would be like if Dickens himself was the one who was held captive. While that may be the basis, the story of misery is more personal than that, as King later admitted that the book was really about his battles with drugs and alcohol, with Annie Wilkes being the stand-in for his addictions, keeping the author hostage and damaging him physically and mentally. One could also surmise that King himself was tired of being associated with just one genre of book, and had grown a bit weary of passionate fans hanging on his every word and then voicing their frustration when his work was not to their liking, which happened after his fantasy novel, The Eyes of the Dragon, was released a few years earlier. The book was published in June of 1987. It was met with some of the best reviews of King's career, but he did find some skepticism from those folks he was writing about, whether or not he was doing so intentionally. His loyal fans. In an article, King's wife Tabitha noted that certain faithful readers of the authors took the Annie Wilkes character to be a reflection of them, and they weren't too happy with what they saw. I have read several pained, angry, and offended letters from fans who mistakenly believe Steve was recording his true feelings about his readers in misery, Tabitha wrote before noting, its exploration of the worst aspects of the celebrity fan connection is obvious and real. Whatever it was truly about, Misery was another hit for King, and like the majority of his books, seemed destined for the big screen. Only one problem, King did not want this one adapted. The author had been burned too many times in his still young career by what he thought were bad adaptations of his work, and he was not about to allow that to happen to Misery. Cut to producer Andrew Scheinman, co-founder of Castle Rock Productions, who was reading Misery on an airplane. Scheinman immediately saw cinematic possibilities in the short, tough novel and relayed as much to his partner at Castle Rock, Rob Reiner. Reiner was on a superb run as director, having helmed the horror-free Stephen King coming-of-age tale Stand By Me, the comedic fantasy The Princess Bride, and the mega-hit When Harry Met Sally, all back-to-back. -back. Reiner could relate a bit to the protagonist in Misery. After years of playing the affable lug Meathead on the iconic sitcom All in the Family, Reiner had much trouble breaking free of that perception of him when he wanted to get into directing films, which he finally did with the legendary mockumentary This Is Spinal Tap in 1984. Plus, he recognizes a good story when he reads one and had already gained King's trust with Stand By Me. 
one of the few adaptations of his work that the author genuinely liked. Furthermore, he had named his production company Castle Rock after King's famous fictional town, and that had to earn him some brownie points. Reiner and King had a meeting, and ultimately King agreed to sell the rights to the director for a buck. His only stipulation was Reiner had to either produce or direct it, to which Reiner agreed, although he didn't intend to direct it at first. Actually, to adapt Misery, Reiner reached out to William Goldman, the writer behind The Princess Bride book and screenplay. At the time, Goldman was one of the most famous screenwriters in all of Hollywood, responsible for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, All the President's Men, and Marathon Man, along with countless uncredited rewrites and script doctoring jobs. He was the go-to guy in town when your script needed work. Goldman read the novel, and that one scene really stood out. You know the one we're talking about. I could not effing believe it. Goldman went on to write in one of his memoirs, I knew she was going to tickle him with a feather, but I never dreamt such behavior was possible, and I knew I had to write the movie. Directing the film was originally going to be George Roy Hill, perhaps best known for directing the Best Picture winner, The Sting, in 1973. Hill had apparently agreed to do it at Reiner's behest, but when it came to that foot-chopping scene, he got cold feet, pun definitely intended, and dropped out. According to Goldman, Hill ended up saying, I was up all night and just could not hear myself saying action on that scene. So concerning was the gruesome but pivotal scene that Reiner decided to take an informal survey of the people who worked at Castle Rock. Should the scene stay or go? Eventually, the consensus was for it to stay in, but it would eventually get changed to make it slightly, just slightly, less horrifying. Reiner and producer Andrew Scheinman started doing their own drafts of the screenplay, and one of the key changes was that scene. The director decided to change it to Annie smashing Paul's foot with a sledgehammer. Not nice, not at all but perhaps a bit less graphic than the foot coming clean off thanks to an axe. Goldman initially was not pleased. He thought that they had ruined what was going to be the biggest standout scene in the movie. He couldn't convince them to go back to the source material and later on would admit that he was wrong and they were right. The thinking being that if Annie had chopped off the foot, the audience reaction would have tainted the rest of the film. Figuring people would have told their friends to steer clear of the movie because of this disgusting scene. After George Roy Hill departed, Reiner took over directing duties, his first horror movie. The search for a lead actor to play Paul was on, and it turned out to be a rather tortuous process for Reiner. Actor after actor turned it down. From Jack Nicholson, to Dustin Hoffman, to William Hurt, to Richard Dreyfuss. Dreyfus apparently expressed interest for a while, but eventually passed all the same. Goldman theorized that most of the actors passed because they saw the character of Paul as playing second fiddle to the much showier character of Annie. The actor who came closest to participating was Warren Beatty, who, while not formally committing to it, did some work on the script with Reiner. At the end of the day, however, he got nervous about the role. Goldman thought it was ultimately because of that foot bashing scene. Reiner still credits Beatty with making the script better than it was during the time that he was interested. Finally, Reiner found his Paul Sheldon in James Kahn. At the time, Kahn wasn't exactly the name that he was in the 70s and early 80s, but still enough of a recognizable actor that audiences were familiar with. Now came the crucial job of finding the right Annie Wilkes. Among the rumored names included Bette Midler and Angelica Houston, but both turned it down and would later say that they regretted the decision. It's been said that despite going after some A-listers, Reiner and company actually wanted an unknown for the part, an actress that audiences wouldn't recognize and who carried no baggage from prior big screen parts. Goldman claims it was his idea to cast Kathy Bates, who at the time was a highly respected theater actress with a handful of supporting roles in movies, but who was very far from being a household name. Bates was used to doing lots of rehearsal. Khan, on the other hand, liked to work with as little rehearsal as possible. 
While this wasn't a deal breaker by any means, it took some time for the actors to appreciate each other's methods, and Reiner had to find a middle ground between the two opposing styles. At one point during the shoot, Bates relayed to Reiner that she was frustrated with Khan not listening to her, which prompted the director to say, You're right, he's not. His character doesn't care one iota about yours. Use that to fill your rage. I'll take good care of you. I'm your number one fan. In preparing to play a serial killer, which is what Annie Wilkes is revealed to be, Bates read up on people like Ted Bundy and other killers who were able to blend into society while committing their heinous crimes behind closed doors. As fate would have it, Bates knew about Annie before becoming attached to the film, as a friend of hers some years prior had handed her a copy of Misery and said, when they make a movie out of this, you should play Annie. Give that friend a bonus. Bates would say in a 1991 interview that she didn't consider Annie a monster in a horror movie, rather a human being who is a psychopath. Though she didn't go full method with her performance, Bates found it challenging to play Annie, especially towards the end of the shoot. She recalled feeling very disconnected from people, not enjoying the role, and one day Reiner, sensing her isolation, reminded her to leave her work at the studio at the end of every day and to not bring the baggage of playing the character home with her. Obviously, whatever she did worked. Khan said in a New York Times interview the next year, it didn't take much acting for me sometimes. Like when I think she's going to smash that thing in my head, she'd scare the hell out of you. In that scene, she was gone. Nevada stood in for some of the snowy mountains of Colorado, but the majority of the filming took place in a studio in Los Angeles, with the lion's share of the sequences taking place inside the bedroom where Paul is held captive. Khan and Bates later joked it was an exciting day whenever he got to move into any other section of the house. Khan would quip that Reiner hired the most neurotic actor in Hollywood, only to have him lie in bed for 15 weeks. It's for the best. Hey, please! When it came to shoot what would go on to become the film's most notorious scene, the hobbling, a pair of fake legs were made out of gelatin by KNB FX Group, who would go on to become Hollywood's go-to makeup and gore wizards. James Caan was in a bed with holes cut out at the bottom where his real legs would go, while the prosthetic legs were attached at his knees. But shooting the scene, which both Bates and Reiner apparently found to be very unpleasant, would take a toll on the feet themselves, which began to get rubbery, prompting artist Howard Berger to eventually attach a wire to the fake foot so he could hold it down after Bates whacked it with a sledgehammer. Another change in terms of gruesomeness was the death of the sheriff character, Buster, played by Richard Farnsworth. In the book, the sheriff is killed by Annie in a very Stephen King-like manner. She runs him over with a lawnmower. In the film, however, Buster is blasted in the back with a shotgun. Allegedly, Bates wanted the lawnmower scene in the movie, but Reiner was concerned it would look too silly on the big screen. So he opted for something a little more subtle. Or, I mean, as subtle as a shotgun blast can be. Misery was released by Columbia Pictures on November 30th, 1990, making it one of the more unusual holiday movies of the year. While it stepped right into the third week of the juggernaut known as Home Alone, Misery did mighty well for a movie with its subject matter, grossing $10 million during its opening weekend. It would then stick around throughout the winter, ultimately raking in around $61 million domestically. Last night it came so clear. I realize you just need more time. Eventually you'll come to accept the idea of being here. If the box office didn't solidify Misery as a movie to be taken seriously, the Academy certainly made it official when Kathy Bates won the Oscar for Best Actress in early 1991. Bates was considered a dark horse that year, with the well-known Angelica Houston, who of course turned down the Annie role, and Pretty Woman's Julia Roberts seen as the frontrunners. But Bates won it all the same. She thanked all of her collaborators and apologized publicly for the ankle bit. Bates naturally wondered if she was going to get typecast as a crazy person soon after, but obviously did not and still enjoys a career filled with diverse and eclectic roles. School? You going to school? Ah! 
Misery would later go on to be turned into a stage play, written by William Goldman and starring Bruce Willis and Laurie Metcalf. And Annie Wilkes even got an origin story to call her own during the second season of the J.J. Abrams-produced Castle Rock, where she was portrayed by Lizzie Kaplan. The character will never likely be forgotten, and no doubt Annie would be pleased to know that she has more than a few number one fans of her own. She can't be dead. Misery Chastain cannot be dead.